right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Crazy Juicy Love Podcast. I have this awesome man, Casey Garrity. He's a licensed therapist. Uh, thank you for being on the show, Casey. Yeah, my pleasure. I'm glad to be here. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about you, more about like your what you do, how you work with clients, who are your clients, and uh, how do you help people? Yeah, yeah. So as you said, I'm a licensed therapist, um, LSW in the state of New Jersey. I um, originally, so, you know, uh, just give a little backstory of how I got to this point. Um, because when I was younger, being a therapist is not what I thought was going to happen. I was Men like, run away from therapy. Oh, 100%. Yeah. You know? And this is now something that's coming up totally organically, something that we haven't even discussed beforehand, but right. that is the reality. Like, me a therapist because I grew up as a very um, athletic, uh, whatever popular, like, had girlfriends, whatever. Um, had some embodiment of I don't know, I guess the male archetype, and um, and it was through my own search for you know meaning, purpose, truth in my life that I ended up at this at this juncture, and uh, I couldn't be happier. You know, I couldn't be happier doing this work, and. I am so grateful because I get to work right now. I work with a lot of men. I've worked with women as well, especially in my um, internship. I worked at a, at a local uh, college, but I um, get to work with a lot of men and men in that age, the age group that we call uh, emerging adulthood now, which is 18 to 25. It's kind of this new uh, arena of life that's been carved out that's characterized by a, by a ton of uncertainty. <laughs> and like, you know, 30 years ago, people weren't staying in college as long as they are now, or maybe um, getting assistance from their family as much as they are now, or, or, or lots of other things. And so the, I guess the trajectory of life has changed quite a bit. And so now we carve out this new area of life called emerging adulthood, 18 to 25. And that's um, a good amount of my clients are in that age group. I also work with uh, clients. I have a few clients that are younger, teenage, like just entering into teenage years. It seems also, you know, as everyone knows, adolescence is a turbulent time. So um, they show up in my office, which is great. I love being able to impact at that level as well. And then I even have, you know, eight-year-old client right now and then up to 35-year-old men. And uh, yeah, it's great. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, me and we just recently, last week, just did a podcast. And so, you know, with him and his girlfriend, with the yeah. relationships. <laughs> and, oh, yeah. and, um, and which that podcast is coming out next week uh, with all three of us. So make sure you guys check that out. And, yeah. you know, so as I was listening to you, I like, I really, you know, really connected and resonated with a lot of things that we were talking about, especially about men. Yeah. And so, you know, we decided I decided to like reach out to you and say hey let's create something around men and what men struggle with and what we're dealing with and you came up with four great uh topics mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. yeah. that a lot of men that I see that I coach struggle with and friends and family and men in general struggle with these things and we're just going to go through you know four of them and just like just break down and be of hopefully be of service to men that are listening to this. Um, so, so one of the first things uh, that you know Casey brought to my attention is like uh, self-expression that men keep things stuffed down. So you know, so I'm just my pose my question to you like, why do you think that men uh, have a hard time expressing? themselves and keep his stuff stuff down because I know from, from for sure for me that I struggle I used to struggle with that a lot from your um, your sessions with your clients what do you notice like what do you think and what did you maybe share with what you have struggled with uh, being self-expressed yeah that's a great question um, it's definitely the first thing that came to mind and it's the first thing that comes to mind uh, thinking about you know some of the cases and clients that I'm working with right now is this idea of self-expression and it's honestly something that I've struggled with all, for a lot of my life I would say I've, probably 28 years of it it's only been really recently that I've uh, felt like I've had the space to to express my inner thoughts um, and so I think for men it, it I don't have a list exactly of you know all the different factors because it is certainly um, 
diverse. All the factors I would say are pretty diverse uh, that contribute to this like lack of self-expression. I would say part of it is environmental. I would say a large part of it is environmental. Um, at some point, at some point in time, um, a lot of us men may have been self-expressed and gotten rejected or shut down or shunned because of it. And even thinking about myself, this is something that we talked about, you know, just recently. Uh, you know, my dad would always say, stop feeling sorry for yourself. Stop right. feeling sorry for yourself. Um, and I would say that's also akin to this underlying, or sorry, this underlying principle in our culture, like men don't cry. Right? Yeah. That's an underlying principle. And I feel like those two are pretty connected. Like we're just not supposed to show emotion. It's like stoicism, right? Marcus Aurelius' stoicism right. is like really heralded as this. I like, have the book, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> as this uh, incredible like way to be, right? Don't be affected by anything too much. Right. Hold and, the armor up. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Hold the armor up. And that for me is how I live a ton of my life. Right. And so, yeah, because I was just really sharing with you with that, that phone call and actually, which prompted me to rewatch this uh, documentary called The Mass That We Live In. Um, and based off some other things that I studied and read and um, a lot of it, like I was telling you before, are these old beliefs that men uh, hold on to. And it's some of the specific things that they were talking about, like, you know, the biggest thing, theme that they kept saying over and over again, they even showed clips of uh, the uh, the um, the uh, the documentary was showing clips of like parents saying, "Don't cry, suck it up." All these yeah. coaches and stuff like that. And one of the the guys, uh, the coach, he was an ex NFL um, coach. He was saying, he said, "Those things don't work." Um, with men he's like especially you know he he was just sharing like he was on the play, playing field one day I think he was a coach the head of the coach for the Kansas, Kansas City Chiefs and he was like I saw a lot of my uh, guys were in their head they were dealing with things and I can't put them out on the field if I don't tackle what's going on inside mm-hmm. so he decided to change the way he approached each guy instead of asking them what they're doing in the field ask them what are you dealing with at home that's probably affecting you right now and he said that changed the way the guy started to play on the field because he allowed them to express and get it out and not hold in his sense of aggression and so the men started to be more freer more open and it also changed the dynamic within the team because the team kept were even more supportive even more connected even more closer once they started to change the conversation with each and every man on the team so going back to what you're saying like a lot of these old beliefs that i found that men hold on to um, stuff down their expression uh, from in love, relationships, all work, uh, yeah. all mm-hmm. of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's exactly right. It's it's they they, they stuff down their expression, and I don't think because you can't really quantify this. It's incredibly difficult to quantify. Like if you were to do a right. study on this, and to be honest, I haven't looked, but I would imagine that very few exist. Like, what is the effect of um, years and years of suppressed self-expression on mm-hmm. on on just how you are being in your daily life? Yeah. Right? Because if if you're constantly stuffing down ex- ex- uh, self-expression, then um, every minute you're in a social interaction, you're basically self-censoring. Right. Don't say this, say this. Like, I can't be, uh, I can't overexpose myself too much. I can't be too vulnerable. Right. And that's exhausting. And it know? affects relationships over and over again. Like, if I was exactly. thinking, I was sharing with you the podcast, um, Where Do We Begin? And like, if you, like, I'm not sure if you started listening to it, but when you hear the man and they're in this couple session with Esther Perel, like they can't, like a lot of them can't even articulate or, and she, I don't know how she does it, but she's able to articulate the therapist, the few words that he's saying with, um, uh, with, with the wife and they mm-hmm. all have this pent up and, um, expression they can't express themselves or really um, allow themselves to articulate emotional intelligence and I was gonna I remember sharing a story with you about um, November which is like a men's awareness month uh, in November which is called Movember which started in Ireland and um, and uh, they created this podcast and one of the podcasts 
uh, very short-lived podcast, one of the men, uh, it was like a, a straightforward interview, like you don't hear any, anybody else but the, the man who's talking. And so in the interview, the man, he was explaining how he tried to commit suicide three times yeah. and he failed three times. Mm-hmm. And he was explaining to him, to uh, the interviewer, that he's like, because I had cancer and I couldn't tell anyone. And I was a sergeant on the force. And if I told anyone that I had cancer, then they were gonna move me to an office. They were gonna think of me differently. I didn't even tell my family. Like I was just, I, and I was just dying inside and just tell someone. And then finally on the third attempt, the, I, I can't, the doctor asked him his, uh, some questions. He was like, I think you need to see a therapist because he had been avoiding <laughs> seeing yeah. a therapist. And finally he got to see a therapist. He said that was the journey of his healing because he was able to express his healing, what he was dealing with. And he started, he was cancer free for a couple of years because he was able to get it out and not hold it all in. Mm. Are you saying um, that it's possible there might have been a connection between his ability to free himself up mentally and his recovery to can- through cancer uh, of cancer? Yeah, there's been a lot of studies, like especially with uh, 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 Esther Perel, uh, Louise Hayes. She had cancer, so when mm-hmm. you know she had stage, actually she had stage four cancer, and remember she told the doctor, said, "Okay, wait." I'm going to do something first before I go into chemotherapy. And one of the things she started to do is look at where she was uh, unexpressed, where she hasn't said things to certain people, what she was holding back, what like all these things. And she started to tackle each one of them. And then within six months, her cancer back. Clearly not, I'm not saying like that's the root thing. Like there's right. many other things that cancer causes, but there has been a number of um, even Wayne Dyer talks about the same exact thing, how it, um, he started to heal himself from cancer, like the root of like all these pent up things that he was holding back. And even in um, mm-hmm. Dr. Cam, um, in the book, The Anatomy of the Spirit, I forgot the doctor's name. Um, but anyway, she, like, she breaks down the body um, and she, like in all the diseases where the body ha- um, lies. And then right. within those diseases, she put the, the root causes um, of each disease in the body. And even uh, Louise Hayes, you can heal your life. She also breaks down the body and the problem that's associated with the body. Mm-hmm. And I was like, ooh, like, because I used to have a lot of back problems and back problems was, uh, <laughs> uh, um, uh, connected to money and so and I was like oh that like every time I have a money issue that I, I noticed how my body feels so when we have issues we hold it in our body like there's a book called the body keeps score and so they talk about how when I know you that go book. through yeah when you go through issues you, yeah you hold it within your body and everybody holds different placements for different issues and different parts of their body yeah yeah that's so true i uh yeah i tend to um, a lot right i tend to hold stress in my gut so mm. i have like gi problems and oh. uh, yeah when i went through that uh, particularly turbulent period of my life i was like you know having gi problems <laughs> um luckily i you know i was probably young enough that it was you know i was able to resolve it on its own but you know years and years and years of that i mean there's no telling what the long-term damage of that is yeah yeah so how did so how did you yeah. well how can man how well first how did you start to step into your self-expression yeah i think um for me and, and everyone's story is going to be a little bit different but the, the genesis of that for me would be at first it was developing a lot of insight um through yeah. like recover so like recovery 12-step stuff I'm, I'm involved i was involved in that um therapy and you know going back 10 11 years and i, I was able to develop a lot of insight the, the thing that i still was uh, even though i had a ton of insight and um I was still unable to express that outwardly you know, for, for fear of it being rejected or fear of um, hurting somebody, um, particularly my girlfriends at the time. Uh, and so I, you know, didn't 
feel like I had the space to really to really say very much. But I was developing inside. I was taking a look at myself. I was expressing these things to my, you know, some of my, you know, male friends. I'm um, not all of them still keeping some things in. Um, and eventually, I stayed with therapy, and I got to the point where I was in another relationship that was uh, going down in flames. I'll say that. <laughs> another relationship that was going down in flames and still the thing that was missing was i was still unable to be self-expressed and to freely express my thoughts and feelings because once again that same those same ideas were there you know i'm gonna break this poor girl's heart by saying some of these things that are on my mind even though they weren't really based in reality that wasn't the point it was just like i just needed i just needed to express them to, to my significant other and I didn't feel like I had the space to do that because they were going to get offended and whatever and some of that might have been true and some of that was on me that's a different conversation uh, but really I, I, I credit a lot of it with being in so much pain that I had no other choice you know? it was like I was yeah I was in so much pain I was suffering so much uh, like clinical levels of depression I'm a therapist so I know how to diagnose depression anxiety I had both of them <laughs> wow <laughs> yeah Wow. I saw you lean into the mic. Were you going to say something? No, no, it's okay. Oh. I just want to just, um, I'm just like, wow. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, clinical levels of depression, anxiety from this uh, really, and as we were talking right before the podcast, this is really where I started questioning. Um, I wasn't having suicidal thoughts, but I was really beginning to question just the, the, the nature of life and existence and mm. what are we all doing here? And, and you know, the, <laughs> some death anxiety, which was great for my personal growth. Right. Oh, God. <laughs> right now. But it really came down to this point. I'm in a relationship now where I'm confronted with that um, same fork in the road. Either I hold on to this and I'm going to be anxious and depressed and miserable again, or I express myself. And the benefit uh, outweighs the cost for sure. And 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 also my partner, and I give a lot of credit to her, and I know not everyone's going to have a partner as understanding as mine is, but my partner is very understanding and she's able to hold a lot of the things that I tell her, some of the uncertainties of myself right. and my life and the relationship and, and not internalize and not to get personal. She's able right. to see that it's a reflection of you know me, not her. Go right. Ahead. And, I, and I, since I know your girlfriend, uh, yeah. you know, it's, it's also because we all have done this sort of uh, personal development work in the same program that we did, you know, but, you know, a lot of it is really, and this is where I see pe men or people in general struggle in relationships, especially one of my uh, particular relationships I'm thinking about right now, is that, you know, your your girlfriend has the has learned or has the ability, especially her whole family has done this program, has the ability to really just listen and not take what you are saying as like you're like a threat right. or like there's something about me like well like she has a and she also has the ability to look at herself mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know and not take what you say make it mean anything because the minute you make what i say mean triggers some kind of insecurity some kind of like panic attack some kind of like threat or like causes um like pain with each other your, go your girlfriend has that ability to not and i wish that people would learn like learn to like um that's actually a, a, a therapy technique called the imago dialogue where you're just there to ask a question you listen and repeat and, it's, and it has nothing to do with you you're just there to receive what the other person is saying understand that's mm -hmm. it and the more people just like olivia just like taking what you were you're almost sound like it's she's taking what you're saying receiving it and like i guess you know repeating it back to you just to make sure that you are heard mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. that helps so much in relationships yeah. you know yeah this is what i teach um relationships in, in in relationships and working with you know other couples or even with a you know parent and a 13 year old kid is exactly what you said that reflective listening you tell yeah. me something and i reflect it back to you using my own words if you don't feel like i got it then you correct me right it's such it's oh my god it's such a powerful so tool <laughs> it is it really is you know <laughs> so simple, <you> know? <laughs> that's all it is it, it is it is, is. 
you'd be amazed. Um, and I do that in, you know, just one-on-one when I'm working with men and, and, you know, coming back to the self-expression piece that we're talking about here is that it's amazing. It, it's, it's mind blowing to me how quickly I would say at least half of my patients begin feeling better in the first probably four or five sessions just because they have someone who's sitting there listening to them doing, doing the reflective listening repeating right. back what they said and just not judging it that's it right it's and they funny. immediately get better yeah it's so, it's so funny <laughs> right because i was sharing with you um one of my straight friends you know he um he came over to my uh, we were doing a podcast here and i was i was recently i was coaching him and we had to we would finish up um podcast and we have lunch together here and like make order food and eat at my apartment and so all of a sudden out of nowhere he started sharing these really personal things with me and I was like I was like not like I was grateful that he was sharing it with me but I was like I said you I was like you're this is really personal. It's like, why did you, why did you share this with me? Because I didn't ask for it. He goes, I feel really comfortable with you. You allow me to express and be myself. Right. And I was like, really? And he said, yeah. He's like, I can't do this with my straight friends. Well, just, <laughs> he's like, I said, like, you just like, you just listen to me and not judge me and not like you just, you just somehow get me. And I was like, ah, <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, because I don't yeah. like, I just don't take what he says personal. I don't like judge him. I don't like criticize what he's doing. I just listen to and offer something. If not, then I just move on. I don't just don't take anything on. I don't take his stuff on. Right, right. And uh, I think, right, you, you brought up something once again, really, really important that, um, that, that crossed my mind. And I had this old therapist, well, not old therapist, but a therapist from a while ago. He, he was big in this old school psychology, like Freudian, um, uh, Jungian, like school of thought, which uh, I actually have come to find some value in. Anyway, they talked a lot about archetypes, like these um, certain, I guess, patterns that men and women fall into. Mm-hmm. And like the female archetype that he would talk about, and this is of course just a a generalization and this doesn't apply to everybody, but the female archetype often, um, there's this filter that this information goes through. And we have an art, we have a filter as well. Men have a filter as well. And I can talk about that. But for women, it seems like this filter is, you know, is he gonna leave me? Does he really love me? And it seems like with Mm. at least other women that I've dated, that constantly comes up. And when that's, and so when you're filtering it through that, it seems like these things, if I'm gonna talk about uncertainty, is gonna go through that filter and that fear is gonna be triggered, right? Right. And then, then maybe you go on the offensive and then you get hurt and then you get, you know, once you're fearful and, uh, and, and it's not about, and, and it's not about that. It's just like you, like we're talking about, it's just about sitting there and listening to what I'm saying. And, right. and, and that, that's enough to clear it up usually. Right. And I know you said that because that, what you just said to me, filter comes up with my, in my training, we call it, um, core beliefs. So everybody mm-hmm. has a core belief about themselves and what sounds like what you're saying, most people what I'm hearing is like the filter that most women do with is I am alone. So or he's uh, the men always leave. So yeah. if that's your core belief. If that's your idea about men, then you look for those things. You like constantly checking the phone. You're constantly doing this thing, or it's in, which also kind of affects the man because now he can't express them, express himself because now he feels like I. I'm not good enough. What am I doing? That's not wrong. Everything. Yeah, she always yeah. like all over me. And like, you know, I had a client. He was so frustrated with his girlfriend. Like he felt like he, like she literally would call him as he leave the house. He, she, cause he used to like do teach me yoga too. And he would come over here. She would call. He had to check in with her when yeah. he got here. He had to check in when he left. Like it was just he was like it's driving me insane. Yeah. And I said, you know she has a belief she doesn't trust men and that that trust was that that belief about men was there before you yes. and it was it was her mother passing that belief down to her which was affecting their relationship so he felt that nothing that he ever could do was good enough for her mm-hmm. and it like mm-hmm. drove him crazy he couldn't re- he was so pent up he couldn't express himself he couldn't like anytime he tried to express himself it just blows up 
into yeah. this whole thing. Mm-hmm. He's like, I'm just trying to express myself to you. This is not an attack on you. I just want to be able to be free to express myself without leading to an argument. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and and uh, and right. So and also, men aren't off the hook either because men, I would say, the one that comes up commonly. Uh, is is the neediness? She's needy. She's too yeah. needy. And I don't know if that's in reality or, or or wherever it is, but it seems like if that's you know the core belief, like I you know that women are going to be always needy, then that's exactly what I'm going to be attracting. Right. Because <laughs> that then nothing she can do is like you know makes it not good enough. Because like mm-hmm. she wants to spend time when she's needy. Like she, she just wants to spend time. With yeah. 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 Exactly. You know? <laughs> yeah. No. Like if you don't give it any meaning. It's Oh, like, because actuality, you know, we were talking about love languages in the last podcast. The the partner is actually giving you a sign, like how to fill her love tank. Like, I want to spend time with you. It's not about being needy. I, this is what I want you to feel loved. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm curious. So I know we're you, right now. We're talking a lot about um, just you know hetero couples. I'm curious uh, if if these archetypes or these. Um, patterns, these core beliefs show up in your relationships. Oh, oh, all the time. Like, yeah. and how think, maybe they show up? Um, you know, um, because with gay men, yeah. you know, a lot of studies show that because gay men go through this process, so coming out can be very traumatic and very. Mm-hmm. Um, very uh it's a it's a it's a moment in one's life that one starts to create a mask or a you know archetype for themselves um in order to be able to come out to be confident that's why like in the gay community there's all with this there's so many like subtitles of like things and so all these subtitles all like you know i'm a bear i'm a twink all these they all have core beliefs of like how they feel they should look and so then gay men make sure they look feel walk talk dress that way and act that way even like saying bottom or top like a top should be acting and behaving this way a bottom should be acting and behave this way we start to create these archetypes of gay men and then we make sure that that's just the way we are of we uh, and so but we all have something and then love comes in and then something happens then we start to develop these core beliefs and also these core beliefs you know as you know they come from they were already there since childhood adolescence and stuff like that and so relationship just sort of like and coming out stuff triggers all triggers it so you know for me like uh, you know they show up I, I, they sh- I think they just, they walk, for me, they walk in the door, like right from the beginning. Um, and, uh, you know, for a person who does a lot of like self-development, I'm a coach and I've sort of developed this ability to like, I can read people's like text messages or their profiles and I can see they're leading with that core belief or the archetype that, that created. Like, you know, like for instance, I'll give you an example. Um, you know, I matched with a guy on like, I think, Hinge or one of these dating apps, you know, and I was, originally I was skeptical of um, uh, matching with uh, swiping right because the way his pictures were organized, I couldn't tell who, which one was the guy that I was looking at because he was with his attract, very attractive best friend in the picture so i was like oh it must be the tall guy because the tall guy was the common person in the um the picture so match with him you know and you know i, I think i sent him a message i said hey handsome how are you doing and then he wrote back are you sure you're referring to me and i was like i i was so confused and i was just like what do you mean he was like are you not referring to my hot best friend in the picture who was straight? And I was like, no, I, I know who it is. It was, see, because if you are, it's totally fine. I don't want to waste my time, you know? And I was just like, okay. I said, dude, I don't think we're a match. 
I was like, I really <laughs> want to be with someone who is confident in who they are. Yeah. And I, I, I it just stopped. Right. <laughs> I'm him back. Yeah, yeah. It's a good read, I would say. <laughs> that's that's the first thing I thought about too. Is just a lack of self confidence, and not to get too into it, but also it's I, I found that interesting that he included his friend in all those pictures as well. Right. So you didn't have to include your friend in those pictures, <laughs> but, right? Yeah, maybe. but yeah, nonetheless. Yeah, um, we're going off on this expression things. Um, so our next one, yeah, we move yeah. on. Responsibility. So why did you feel that responsibility was, you know? something that men struggle with why i mean I, I definitely agree with you like you know elaborate more on responsibility yeah yeah i think responsibility can you know pertain globally to our lives in a very major way but i think as it pertains to relationships um, i kind of see it played out in in one of two ways i think the the one way is um where men try to be overly responsible for the relationship just like yeah. everything that happens like this is this is their like identity basically yeah. and that and then they show up in therapy and they're crushed when their relationship's yeah. over and it takes them a year to get over it yeah go so ahead. you had mentioned before like being the burden of the breadwinner holding it all yeah. on the shoulders exactly yeah which, which i think is in some sense gives men a lot of uh you know gives them a lot of value to their yeah. lives uh, but and then on the other side of the spectrum, I see uh, people who are trying to evade the responsibility for the relationship. They're like kind of that one foot in, one foot out uh, personality. It's kind of like um, I don't know if you know anything about attachment theory. I, um, I I'm familiar with uh, attachment theory. It's one. It's on my to do list. But I um, I know briefly. Uh, I know about it. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, this is kind of a loose connection, but I still want to make the connection because yeah. I think it's relevant. Which is, a, I, I, which I love the theory. I'm just like, when I, <laughs> yeah. uh, there's an app that you can listen to the books like for um, five minutes. And I was like, holy shit. Like <laughs> everybody needs to read this book, Attachment and learn yeah. how they attach. It's, it's like a critical yes, yes. to read. I had the I have the audio book, and oh. so that's, yeah, it's good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right off to give you my login. <laughs> so, but I I, th I think of that when I think of responsibility because of the way that it shows up, right? So, in attachment theory, um, you have sort of three main attachments, and on the and on the front side, the person who's like overly responsible for the relationship, I would say, is more the anxiously attached person. Like they're just fearful. They're fearful. They're, they're they're overly responsible because they're afraid of losing something from the relationship. And on the opposite side of the spectrum, we have the avoidant attachment. And um, the avoidant attachment is that kind of like one foot in, one foot out. You never really quite know how they feel about you. And it's almost like they're not taking enough responsibility for the relationship. They're, you know, it's the type of guy that maybe you're dating for, um, you know, I mean, I don't know. Everyone's a little bit different, but for maybe like two years, this is kind of a over, um, I'm kind of going over on the t over the top of this one, but you're dating for two years and he hasn't said I love you yet. You know, like you just right. after two years you don't know how he feels about you, and and in that sense he's just not taking enough responsibility for the for the relationship. And of course there's that really happy medium ground. There's that secure attachment where yeah. um, where it's very healthy. I feel like there's a healthy amount of responsibility. The person knows when when it's on them to take ownership and when it's not on them to take ownership of yeah. you know what's transpiring within the relationship. Uh, and there's a lot more to it. And once again, I know it's a loose um, association, but I really love it that you brought that up because as you were talking, I re I can recall the study that was that was created. They did a study on children, and they put I don't know if you remember this, but they put them all in a room. Yeah. And they tested the theory, and they had all the children and all the parents in the room. They're playing, playing, and so at one point they tell somehow they signal to the parents to leave. Mm -hmm. So all the parents mm -hmm. leave the room and you start to see people's attach the children's attachment. The child who was uh, secure um, was playing like just didn't, wasn't screaming and the, the, the uh, I forgot the, the attachment theories now, but um, yeah, no. um, but the other one was uh, the one that was, wasn't secure was crying, screaming, one of the parents. And so then they had to, if their child was screaming or looking concerned, the parent had to go back to the room. So the child who was uh, 
not secure would go immediately to the parent and the right. child that was sort of off and on kind of go into the parent or check in go into the parent check in and then the parent who had the responsible kid the kid didn't even go to the parent at all they were just like yeah. you're just fine i see you from here i'm good and yeah. you keep on doing what you're doing that's a famous famous study uh it's called <laughs> strange situation i think the strange situation perhaps i think that's what it's called but yeah, I mean, that was, that was pretty much spot on, you know, and, and, and that the idea with that is that that uh, how we react that early from an age um, will determine how we are in relationships for the rest of our life. Right. Oh, God. It is, unless we do something to change it. Yeah, unless we, exactly. Um, you know, um, I mean, well, how do you find balance um, within that responsibility? Um, you know, and I go back to this, you know, was, I was sharing with you, I think it's uh, with Brene Brown. I think the video is the power of vulnerability. And she was saying how when she wrote Darren Greatly, she was on a, a book tour and a man came up to her and he was like, well, where are the men in this book? <clears throat> mm -hmm. And she was like, right. Cause I, she barely, she only mostly focused on women. Mm -hmm. um, she kind of loosely talking about men in the book. And then she's like, well, you're in there. He's like, no, you know, this is what you want. You know, most women want to keep that image of me on the white horse. Like I'm the knight in a shiny armor and there is nothing, I cannot be anything else but that. And mm -hmm. the minute I fall off my white horse and I look weak or like I can't do it, then you're done with me, you're off, you know basically off with my head and so you know and I was like oh that's a really good one like how you know that responsibility for men it's like it's real and they feel like they have to prove because God knows when my first relationship I just thought I had to just take the burden of everything you know just like yeah I had to clean and do all the laundry do all this to like help make this person happy and I did like you know make sure that we're good here good then I just like I, I was exhausted yeah, you know yeah. uh, and it wasn't a balanced relationship mm -hmm, so I'm just curious mm -hmm. of like how what do you think of how how have you learned how to create that balance mm -hmm. um, with being responsible and being okay with you know I don't need to be responsible right now yeah, it's a lot easier said than done. I'll say that. It's not <laughs> it is, clear. I know. I think, um, I think what is incredibly helpful, what has been incredibly helpful for me, uh, is understanding that when I'm taking ownership for something, that doesn't mean that I'm admitting I'm wrong. <laughs> right. And I think that's what prevents us from taking ownership of something is that we think that I'm admitting defeat, I'm admitting that I'm wrong, and now you're gonna walk all over me and do as you want, or now, uh, you know, because I was wrong, I'm weak. Yeah. It's not that. For me, the way that I balance it is that when I notice something, an area maybe where I've fallen short or I've taken a misstep, perhaps I said something that um, was mean or hurtful or perhaps just a way that I'm being like right now as I explained in in, in the um, you know my relationship like my girlfriend is very very driven like just super crushing it right daily <laughs> just a straight freaking powerhouse locomotive moving quick right yeah. all the time and me I'm more laid back I'm more chill not saying I'm not getting anything done There's, I could probably do more totally understand that and we're starting a business together, right? And she is doing a lot of the work right now. And through that, she's you know getting really upset with me. And I think for me, the major different, you know, the major differentiation for me is that I'm not taking responsibility for her being upset. That's on her. Right. If she's upset, that's something she needs to own. However, what I am taking responsibility is on how I'm being. Is perhaps yeah. that I'm not being the best person that I could be, and and perhaps that it and perhaps that is having an impact on you. Yeah. And I feel like that's the balance. Is and and something you said um, about the previous that previous relationship. The thing I picked up on there was that. I just, uh, you said, I want to make them happy. I want to make sure that you're happy. And I come to realize that I don't have that power, right? I think <laughs> I don't is, have that power. Which is an old belief. Like when people say, you know, um, hold on, um, that, that 
I I just want to make you happy. I don't. Oh, I want to make you happy. It's such a burden, a weight, and a huge responsibility to try to make someone happy. And that learning, 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 and getting that really changed a lot for me. And I remember, and I think I really got it. Um, there's an episode with uh, Will Smith and Jada Pickett on the Red Table, Jada Pickett show, and you know, they were it was a two part with Will Smith and Jada talking about their marriage, and which I didn't know they had gone through this whole struggle, you know, for two years, and, um, and then Will said to her one day, "It's not my responsibility to make you happy. It's your responsibility to make you happy, and it's my responsibility to make me happy." We're gonna go our separate ways, um, which they separate ways with other parts of the house, and you're gonna learn how to make you happy. That's what they said. Other parts and of their McMansion. Yeah, their McMansion, this big ass the $40 house. Forty million dollar house. house in Calabasas. <laughs> I mean, they, they showed the house actually too that he quote unquote built for her. He was uh, like, you know, he was like, that was my own display of my ego. I wasn't. Mm. I was trying to make her happy. God, it I love was that just honesty. me. It's it, 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 like it's such the most honest like how they both not like you did this and that in the, 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 the video but they're like both like sharing how they were taking responsibility mm-hmm. and they both had to go have their own separate therapist do their own research read their own books and then come back and like discuss you know and yeah, yeah. that was like a really like i was like oh that's so good like everybody needs to hear that podcast that um podcast that show of like you know it's not my responsibility to make you happy it's not your responsibility to make me, make me happy i'm responsible for my own happiness and right. you can really like really get that to the core i, I think i mean it, 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 it'll change your life with not just relationships but <laughs> in general yeah that's a major, major distinction that takes people a really long time to get to, if they get to it at all. Yeah. Um, but how freeing it is. And there's also this other part, too, I think, which is important to mention as well, is that could seem a little cold, to, I think, to some yeah, people. Yeah, it can. Like, if you're upset, then, you know, then go after yourself. You're just going to be upset, <laughs> and I'm not going to worry about it. I'm not going to have any empathy for that. But that's not what I'm, you know, it's definitely not what right. I'm saying. Like, when, when, when my partner's upset, like, I have empathy for that. And I am, the language that we use uh, is I am a stand for her happiness. So... Mm. Like I'm not that. responsible for her to be happy, but I am responsible for, um, at least the way that I look at it, I'm responsible for coaching her as best as I can towards her own fulfillment and happiness. Like, how can I help? Granted, some people aren't coachable. Granted, some people aren't going to respond. <laughs> A lot of people. Granted, you know, but that's the thing. I'm not attached to that outcome. What's right. more important for me is that I'm showing up for you. Mm, um, yeah. And then in return, I know that uh, also, and I don't need you to show up for me, but hopefully you will show up for me when right. when the time comes. And that's how you know, and that's how we work it. Is to right. show up for each other when we're you know getting pissed off and making each other wrong and yeah. bad and you know. <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah, I really love what you just said about you know, I, uh, showing up, taking a stand for your happiness, and not you know, and it brought me back to. Uh, this podcast I listen to a lot of these relationship things and <laughs> yeah I uh, take it on I, I teach my clients you know it's really good information like you know and uh, it was Oprah and Alicia Keys they put this podcast <clears throat> recently um and Oprah had brought up um Alicia Keys and uh, Swiss Beats relationship their marriage and she goes you know you two have this really awesome incredible relationship how do you create such a powerful relationship and you know one of the things that she said was and, and i this is a key what are you saying like they really understand each other's strengths and weaknesses and because they understand each other's weaknesses they know how to step in when the other person is weak and know how to not make the other person wrong when they are weak and they know how mm-hmm. um to nurture that weakness so that person can grow in that area. For, for example, she gave an example. She says, like, when we're collaborating together, she goes, he is very, like, flow, like, just going with the flow. 
kind of that way. She goes, I wish I could create, know how to be in that flow. She said, but I have to have structure in order to have flow. And he doesn't have structure. So I bring the structure where he brings the flow. So it, it balances each other out. And I, not, I don't make him wrong because he has no structure, but how he works is how he works. And he respects the fact that I bring in structure. He recognizes that I bring in structure. I recognize he brings in flow and I respect his flow because I'm trying to tap into my flow. So we, we, we nurture each other's weaknesses and we nurture each other's strength and we utilize each other's strength. Yeah, yeah, that's very well said. I mean, that's a great example. That yeah, really and I was just like, example. damn. <laughs> exactly yeah you know um and also like uh you know we were talking about earlier about my like, you mm-hmm. know and i was sharing with you on a phone call is that you know one of the things you know me and oprah and him they did this podcast series of uh, on the new earth and this also clicked for me too because uh one of the number one reasons why men commit suicide is like when they leave some corporate job or get le- uh, uh, or laid off, mm-hmm. they it's really high risk for that man to commit suicide because they yeah. have identified themselves as that job. They hadn't separate themselves. So the I am a lawyer, I am a this. So when you're saying things like that, you you know it's the responsibility of that and it's taken away causes mm-hmm. depression and I was like when he said that I was like oh my god I have to learn how to separate myself from these things because I catch myself saying those things and if I am not if I wasn't that today will I be okay with who I am and not carry the burden of that responsibility and I was like oof a lot of men really struggle with that taking on that burden yeah they really do they definitely do I mean, without a doubt it's uh, I think the most at risk men, and I don't have to, I don't want to fact check this, but uh, for our listeners, you should definitely fact check this. <laughs> I believe it's middle aged men yeah. um, who, I'm not sure, unemployed or have recently just become unemployed. I'm one of those two. Those are the most at risk for committing suicide. Right, yeah. It's like you lose, you know, what, what tethers you to like having some responsibility, which is like value and purpose in your life is no longer there. You're then you're left in the morass and the abyss. You're directionless. You don't know what you're doing anymore. You know, everything that you were building in your yeah. life is now, you know, gone. So what do yeah. you do? Like, you know, can you rebuild it? Of course you can, but at the time you don't see that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So our next one is uh, creativity, like, yeah. <laughs> like, like learning how to create and tap into my creativity in this current state of the world, you know. Um, so why do you feel that, yeah. man? And, you know, uh, struggle with creativity because I, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to give preference, reference to Brene Brown, how she, you know, um, she was talking about how all these corporate people want to talk about innovation and how to grow and but they don't want to talk about vulnerability and she's like well you know creativity is creativity is the birthplace of vulnerability without vulnerability you have no creativity you have no innovation you have Mm -hmm. you you because people can't express themselves so without that like creativity doesn't really exist yeah yeah definitely you know as you know, our listeners might even begin to start realizing is that even though we've brought up separate ideas, these ideas are really interconnected and there's a relationship between all of them. And and so um, self-expression is connected to creativity without a doubt. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think um, once again, when we are so suppressed in our self-expression, it's really hard to find creative space because we're so concentrated on not once again overexposing ourselves not being too vulnerable um, not doing the quote-unquote wrong thing not embarrassing ourselves not looking weak not whatever blah 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 that you know if that's what i'm thinking about all the time then where's the space for creativity where can i find my flow state i can't because i'm so over concerned with just my uh you know how i'm looking <laughs> right and I, I agree like you know i know for me some of the things that really hindered my creativity is like basic childhood like you know i was i, I was from elementary to high school like 
you know, raising my hand and being made fun of of some, some creative thing that I've done or being laughed at really hindered me a lot. Like sometimes I won't raise my hand or sometimes I won't speak up because that underlining um, childhood trauma really stopped me. So for me, I, I luckily I found out what the root thing was, but most people don't know that, you know, a lot of our root issues, especially with creativity, um, even though I was in an honors art class, <laughs> you know, like we were like five of us in this class, yeah. you know, um, um, it really just being made fun of, like mm -hmm. really hindered my creativity and I carried that with me and I forgot about it, but it really created, it really hindered me throughout most of my, yeah. adult, my, my, child, my adult life until I recognized, that, oh, I can like really work on that and let that go. Yeah, yeah. I think that's something that um, men need to be responsible for too as a, I guess as a group or whatever you want to say is that we, uh, once again, still have this rigid idea of what it means to be a man and yeah. uh, creativity is perhaps not something that would show up i'm sure if you pulled you know 100 men on the street what it means to be a man i would be very surprised if any of them said creativity you know, right you gave them three choices still i'm sure none of them would say creativity but i feel like uh, creativity is so integral to um, to to who we are and 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 how and, and our success right as you said well um well, you didn't say success, but that's what I was thinking when you said that, you know, creativity is, yeah. vulnerability is the birthplace of creativity, right? And creativity leads to some form of success usually for ourselves because that's where all great ideas come from. Um, but really at the core of it, I feel like being, um, being a man is, 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 um, in uh, is, is directly linked with creativity. Yeah. Well, being human is directly linked with uh, creativity. Yeah. Yeah, and so trying to find that creative space is not always easy because once again, I don't think men are necessarily taught what creativity is, aren't really given a, a good definition of it. Um, you know, once again, we're kind of taught this sort of rigid way to look at life and how to sort of transition through life. You go to school, you go to college, you get a job play for sports. this amount of time, you play sports, right? Be exactly. Tough, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's very because rigid. Right, you know, and then, your path because a lot of men life. and children as they grow up, you know, like especially when I was in, in high school, God, if I was in the arts class, like, because I was like a heavier kid, um, the co the football coaches would be hunting me down. Like, you need to be on a football <laughs> team. You you don't be in this classroom. Yeah, be right. on a football team. Be on a football team. You should be doing this on a football team. You should be in it. I'm just like. And it really pushed me away. I didn't want to do that. And I remember one specific, specific moment at home, like my, my family was the same way. Everybody loved football. And I was like, I don't want to be like that person who's <laughs> like loving football. And I remember yeah. one moment where my grand I was watching something on the, the living room TV. My grandfather came and turned into football. And everybody came in the room, watched football, and I was so pissed. So I had left the room, I went in my mom's room, I turned on the TV and I watched ballet. And I was just like, <laughs> and I, was like I don't want to watch great. football because I was like being Perfect. rebellious yeah. <laughs> against like the football watchers. But, um, but it is like men, we get made fun of when we're tapping into trying some, at least for me, um, some creative endeavor, some kind of art thing. There was like barely any boys or men, boys in any of my arts class. They were all, even though I was in sports too, um, but. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you what, it's true. It's interesting how this, so this comes up right now because as you know, we're filming this during the coronavirus uh, and so everyone's on lockdown and a lot of my clients, they don't, have anything to do yeah like they don't know what to do with themselves and so part of the work i'm doing now with a lot of them is like trying to explore things that might interest them creatively you know yeah. is it i mean reading i think can be creative writing of course can be creative art can be creative building something can be you know creative but i feel like a lot of uh men they just they've never even considered it. They've never explored right. that part of yeah. themselves. And so right now they're struggling that the, the thing that comes up a lot is boredom. And I'm like, okay, okay, okay. Well, what can we create? You know, what can you create for yourself? Boredom is, 
uh, if you're feeling bored, that's your responsibility you know, right. to, to create it's, something you're new. to be bored. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And um, I know we're you know, kind of gotten away from relationships a little bit in this discussion of creativity, but uh, I but think... It, but, but, it's, yeah. but it's not. Like, it, it does affect relationships. But I do have an example where I want you to finish. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, I was basically uh, just keeping that in the back of my mind. Um, if, you know, because if people are wondering, you know, okay, so how does this relate to relationships? But if you have a thought, I'd love to hear it. I do because ahead, that yeah. board, because this is one of the frustrations with women, like they have to do all the work. They have to come be creative. They have to plan all the things and men yeah. don't get creative and leave all the responsibility to the women. And so I remember my first relationship, because I definitely struggle with like being creative in my first relationship because my first boyfriend he was very i mean he, he was very creative like he can plan i it was it was my first relationship i didn't know how to plan mm-hmm. i didn't have to plan come up with gifts <laughs> and he would even like if i got him a specific gift he'd be like you didn't really think about me like he would <laughs> say things like that like you didn't put any thought any creativity to the, in this gift and he was right like i did it and i was just like and it really even after that relationship i saw that pattern like i had no creativity whatsoever mm-hmm. and the people I dated were like always disappointed in me. And I was like, okay, I gotta like tap into being creative with dates and planning and stuff like that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so one of the first things I started to do, it became, I just got better at it. Just, I kind of don't, I got to do still do it. But one of the things that I did in my first relationship, I would like, so I'm in a conversation with him. I, if he said something that he liked or watched or wanted, I would make a mental note and I would keep a list on my phone. So throughout the year, I had all these lists of things that I could either do, make, buy, create. And so by birthday or Christmas, uh, Christmas time, I had all these ideas of what to do and not do my own thing, but do what this person was asking for for anyway so this took the stress off of me and allowed me to take and in, tap into my creativity of how to just be a better partner right the person i'm dating yeah that's uh that's great i i really like how you made that connection because um, when you mentioned that i started thinking about how that shows up even in my own life today and uh, for me, it's it, it's like a fear. Of, it's a fear of failure. It's a fear of putting myself yeah. out there, getting rejected. Fear of you know trying something new, which usually requires creativity, <laughs> and then Check having it. it not work out, right? Like, and and then maybe trying to s- stick to the tried and true method from there. But um, so yeah, I was thinking about that. That was that was uh, a really great connection that you made there. <laughs> <laughs> and so our last you know topic you know which ties up everything is uh yeah. meaning and purpose you know yeah um you know one of the things that steve harvey says in his book you know uh steve harvey says you know men need three things which i still can't think of the third thing he was like we need the nookie <laughs> and we need your support and our purpose and if we don't feel that if men don't feel that you are supporting and cultivating, helping us cultivate our purpose, we don't feel connected to you. Like our purpose in life means a lot to us. And we just want your support, not really to tell us what to do, but well, maybe some men, but just knowing that you are there supporting what I'm trying to do and bring to the table. And that's what a lot of men uh, like crave in relationships. Mm. Yeah. Uh, you, so you're, as it relates to meaning and purpose, like you're saying that men create uh, men crave meaning and purpose in relationships, right? Like yeah. that support and their meaning and purpose, it's, it's, because without that support, you know, especially in a relationship, they're like, well, what what am I doing all this for? Mm. You know? yeah. Like you don't believe in what I'm doing, you don't support what I'm doing, you don't even come to, like that, because that really affected like my relationship, my first relationship, relationship, he didn't really support my purpose, didn't really go to my shows, didn't really come to the things. I mean, he actually, no, I take that back. 
he he chose certain things. He wasn't like I was like I went to every single thing, no matter how good or bad it was. I was there to be supportive. I gave criti- uh, uh, the criticism. Like I just wanted him to win. I like then that's what I wanted. And I didn't feel like he was always there to see me win, and that's what I want in a partner for someone. Just knowing that someone is not just me seeing me win, but who is there like you better do that damn thing. You know what I mean? Um, that support is. I, I I want that support. Mm-hmm. Definitely, yeah, I, I got it. Definitely, um, yeah. So I'm thinking in in how that even shows up in my own relationship, um, in which I really enjoy. It's like when I'm not focused on my, you know, what I said, my meaning, of, right? What I'm focused on, my meaning and right. purpose, what what I'm really driving at. Uh, my girlfriend often helps bring me back there. Mm. She. And, and not in like a judgmental way, but in a, you know, how is this really helping what your big idea is, what you're mm. really trying to drive at here? Mm, that's good. Yeah. And it shows up once again in, in my in my practice, not just with uh, men who are in that emerging adulthood, but it's often, I think, more difficult to find meaning and purpose, but also even with some of my older clients, the clients who are, you know, 30 plus 35, uh, and I even see it in my family with my dad, right? Like, like what is your like meaning? What do you? What's your big game? Like, what are you driving at here? What are you trying to accomplish? Like, are you just sort of um, floating around in the ether, like you know, just trying to <laughs> figure it out, or is there something that you really want to do here? And it's amazing how when we connect with what we are really trying to accomplish in this lifetime, because it is finite, it's limited, and it goes quick. Um, how that can be a um, springboard for our uh, relationship to go to the next level. Yeah. Because now we have something as a couple that uh, we have an understanding as a couple um, that you're going to, well, not that you have to, but that, you know, I hope that you will help me with this endeavor and that you will keep me on this path, you know, for a higher calling, so to speak. Can you, uh, explain the Lion King analysis. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I love it because it was so perfect for oh, what so you talked perfect, about. Yeah. <laughs> the meaning and purpose. Yeah, I love this. So yeah, I got this from Jordan Peterson and it was um, so profound to me when I heard it because it made so much sense. And once again, this goes back to archetypes and like the roles and patterns that we exhibit in relationships. But anyway, the Lion King is such a great example of, of how the female uh, archetype uh, can, can, I guess, guide the male archetype because, you know, then you have the two characters, Nala and Simba, and Simba basically leaves the, the kingdom of the jungle, and he goes and he's hanging out with this warthog and this prairie dog, and what's going on back at the uh, the kingdom is that it's all falling apart because Scar's running it, and it's, you know, just evil all around, and there's no food, and it's dusty, and it's like a wasteland. Yeah. Yeah. And really, Simba is the one who needs to, you know, be called to this action of responsibility, right? That's his meaning and purpose is, is to is to um, basically save the kingdom. And he's out playing with the friggin' warthog and the prairie dog eating grubs when Nala comes along and, and Nala's like, basically sees him and he's like so shocked. She's like, Simba, like, what are you, what are you doing, doing out here? Like, you're the freaking king of the jungle. You're a lion. Like, like basically, like get it together, man. Like you're capable of so much more than you're doing right now. Right. And she reminds him of his purpose. Like your purpose exactly. is to rule the kingdom, not exactly. out here eating fucking bugs and shit. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I mean, that's it. And then you know, there's these like wrestling scenes, and there's this one scene that Jordan Peterson points out where. Um, Simba finally pins Nala and that's like, you know, him coming into his own. Not that you should ever get in physical, you know, <laughs> fights with your partner, not, not saying that at all, but it's like he finally comes to this realization of, oh, wow, okay, I see what's going on here and and, and I need to basically take this call to action and, and assume this responsibility and my meaning and purpose and to stop galloping around in the freaking, you know, jungle with the warthog and the prairie right. dog eating grubs. <laughs> right. And, it's, and I, you know, I, I love the image, you know, him, Simba pinning her. And for me, that's 
what came to my mind is when you're with someone, because they, we all know that they're they're meant to be together. Yeah. And when you look into the eyes of someone, you he knows he's meant to be with her. Yes. When you look into the eye of the person, one that knows who you are, your responsibility, your capability, and you see that conviction, it just reminds you like it's like oh, this person sees me, yeah, knows my purpose, sees my purpose, um, and you know, and she didn't even make him wrong in that. Like what? Are you, like yeah, what are you? Like what are you doing? You know, mm-hmm. and they didn't have like it wasn't. I mean, of course, it's a movie, but they didn't argue back and forth. Like I'm living my life. I'm just gonna be this. It's like no. It's <laughs> like <laughs> because some people, because it's easy for and I know it's a cartoon, but in in the real and for me in my mind, in life, people will defend that. I'm just out here in the wilderness, like eating the grubs. I'm gonna live my life, grow my hair yeah. out, do all the other things. Like I don't want to do this. Like she's like, no. Like your purpose is to rule the kingdom. Mm-hmm. Like you, exactly, this is, this is your kingdom. You can you can eat bugs if you want to, but your purpose, yeah. you know, yeah. is to go back to the kingdom and and, and restore it. Mm-hmm. I like what you said. It's you know when you have that moment with your with your partner where you really see each other, this idea of morality fades into the back. It doesn't even exist. And that like right and wrong, it's it, it, it doesn't exist. It's really about um, actualizing my potential as a yeah. human being and what I'm truly, really capable of as a human being. We have yeah. so much power. I mean, it may not seem like that because there's over almost 8 billion of us on this planet, but we have so much power Yeah. and, um, and, and such a finite, you know, lifespan. And so, you know, if you want to go eat grubs in the, in the jungle, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. However, I would be very hard pressed to find that, that you're actually really fulfilled doing that. Yeah. I feel like that, you know, at least on some level, there would be some doubt as to whether this is really what I'm supposed to be doing, just because I know at some level what I'm truly capable of. And that's, I think, what our partners can help us get to. You know, what is our calling? What is our purpose? And that's what, you know, me and my girlfriend are focused on. My girlfriend has this um, YouTube channel that she's, you know, and it's not easy, you know, doing something like that, putting yourself out there like that. And there's a lot of fear involved and, and maybe there's some rejection and, and it's not going quite where you want it to be. Right. But what is she, what is, what is she committed to? What's her big idea? What is her purpose? And it's, and it's me as my, as her partner, I take it as my responsibility. I am responsible for being a stand for her being committed to that. And it's amazing when each other, the two of you are, are playing off of that in each other. She's helping me do that. I'm helping her do that. How much love comes out of that. And yeah. how present we get to be yeah. with each other. It is truly amazing. I, and I wouldn't be able to talk about it unless I actually had an experience with it. That's for sure. It's so hard to put words to it, but that's you know, yeah. pretty much what's going on. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah. Oh, man. I feel like we could be talking about Oh, yeah. I could keep going. I know. <laughs> yeah, we're at an hour and twenty. I think. I right? know. Uh, but I'm gonna come to. We we'll have a part two here. Yeah, we have a part two. Uh, but I'm gonna ask you a couple of questions based sure. off of what I ask every single person that comes on the show. Perfect. Um, and you just tell me whatever comes to mind. So, what does a life of love mean to you? Mm. Say. Uh life of love emotional understanding and just real quick i want to expound on that because i was reading something this morning i think as human beings we um have this we live these isolated lives and even though and i don't mean isolation i mean specifically no matter what, I will never know what your experience is like. I can never truly know what you, Jimmy, are experiencing in your life. I can never be you. And the same thing goes for me. You can never be me and no one could ever be me. And I think because of that, at some fundamental level, there's um, an isolation comes out of that and a real sadness, you know, because we have such a longing to want to really connect with other people. But in love, 
we get to get as close as possible to truly knowing what it is like to be somebody else. Well, not to be somebody else, but what somebody else's life is really like, you know? It's yeah. amazing. They're our most authentic, purest form of themselves. And that's what a life of love is all about. Awesome. That's, so, that's, that's really beautiful, man. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, how do you get out of your own way? Oh, man. That's a, that's a good question. A tough one. Um, how do I get out of my own way? Sometimes I don't. <laughs> well, I know we all do. We all no, don't. When I am able to, yeah, when I am able to get out of my own way, it's usually because of my experience, um, taking an honest look at my experience and what the facts of my experience show me. It's like, is the way that I'm being, the way that I've done this over and over again in my past actually brought the result that I wanted to bring? Mm, that's a good... Mm. I love that. And a lot of the times, um, it, it, when I'm, you know, no, it doesn't. And when I see it enough times and I experience it enough times, then for me, that there comes that willingness to change. Yeah. You know? That's that's so good. I wish more people would have that approach. Like, are the actions that I'm doing getting what I want? And then yeah. have that ability to stop and go... <laughs> These actually are getting the results that I want, and we shift and make a change. You know, yeah. it would. Ugh. Yeah, Good. that's it. That's yeah. why we always ask. You know, therapy is all about goals, right? And Olivia and I. You know, we did a coaching sessions and and these two couple the couple was arguing with each other right and i just stopped and i go hang on a second what do you guys want what do you guys want from this relationship you know and they, they identify when we want to be happy and free okay is what you're doing right now going to get you to be happy and free no okay so let's set the egos aside and let's get that let's let's really talk you know, like that's right. it right there <laughs> right so and next last question is what is uh a ju what does a juicy love life looks like to you oh juicy i like that because <laughs> when i think of juicy i think of that uh that bubble gum that juicy bubble oh gum my god you yeah in your mouth and it's just like you can't get enough of it right like it's so flavorful it's just overflowing with 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 juices and sugar and sweetness and it's just Oh, you just, I can't eat enough of it at once, right? I'm just like trying to really suck, suck up all, all of that. that it has. Exactly. And I'm just enjoying it so much. And I want more and more and more of it. And that's exactly what I think about a juicy love is that I'm so happy and content with, with the relationship that I'm in that I just want more and more and more of it. Mm. And I'm committed to... Uh, to, to that right I'm committed to finding out how much more we can you know create together how much more we can get out of this uh, you know together not just for myself my own selfish end, but together you know what yeah. can we get together yeah that's what well, I think about <laughs> oh my god so and finally where can people find you on social media oh good question um, <laughs> I would say yeah so for myself um I do have a uh, Twitter. I was telling Jimmy that uh, for mental health, I, I have a stream. It's uh, Astro KC, A-S-T-R-O KC underscore. And that's going to be on Twitch. Or, I'm sorry. That's actually going to be on Twitter. <laughs> Twitch is just going to be Astro KC. And also my relationship happen podcast with my girlfriend, relationship happens.com. And also Instagram relationship, uh, relationship happens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's funny. I called the uh, real quick anecdote. I called the um, GoDaddy people who host our website, and uh, I'm talking to the guy about our relationship, or our, our, our website, and he's like, "Oh, I can't say that word." <laughs> and I thought like that was phone, so funny. Like yeah. Recording. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right, because his work is being recorded. <laughs> it's funny. Oh, anyway. goodness. Anyway, well, Casey, thank you so much. And we'll probably look forward to part two and coming on your show. I can't wait, man. Yeah, I can't man, wait me too. I, I mean, God. The energy. This has been great, you know. Um, anyway, so thank you again. And